Good evening, everybody. It is wonderful to have you joining us tonight. I would like to welcome you to this IDF forum, Paying for Immunoglobulin or IG Therapy. I'm Kathy Antela, Vice President of Education. And on behalf of all of us at IDF, once again, welcome. This forum is being recorded and it will be posted on the IDF YouTube channel within the upcoming week. And then um, also you will be receiving tomorrow an email from IDF with a link to a very short survey about tonight's program. The survey will also include an opportunity for you to tell us what you would like to hear about at future forums. And thank you in advance for just taking a couple minutes to complete that survey and send it back because we really do care about what you want to hear and we'll do our best to bring that information to you, whether it be a forum or a podcast or you know, any lunch and learn, any other way we can. So welcome. As always, quick disclaimer, please remember, the information presented during this event is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified healthcare provider with questions concerning a medical condition. And never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during this event. And actually, this event probably won't have any medical advice because it's about insurance, but you never know. So just so that you're aware, and again, even though this is about insurance, the information you receive here is informational. And as we know, every insurance policy is different. So really important to make sure that we are asking the right questions to the people who we work with to get the answers that we need. IDF's mission. For over 40 years, the Immune Deficiency Foundation has served as the trusted organization for the primary immunodeficiency community and with a mission of improving the diagnosis, treatment and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education and research. We truly value our role as a patient organization. And as a result of our mission, IDF seeks to ensure that everyone in the US affected by PI has a fully informed understanding of the PI diagnosis that affects them, all available treatment options, the expected standard of care, and all of their opportunities for connection and support within the PI community. Whether you're an individual with PI, a family member, friend, or a healthcare provider, IDF is here to help you. When you have a question about living with PI, health insurance, or anything else, simply go to our homepage and click on Ask IDF, submit your question, and one of our staff members will follow up with you. If you're looking for support, we have virtual IDF Get Connected groups throughout the year based in many communities throughout the country. And even if you live in New York, you can join a Get Connected group in California if that time works for you. But these groups are exclusively for individuals with PI and family members. And they are led by our amazing Get Connected leaders who are volunteers and it is a wonderful way to get support and receive information from others in a small group setting right from your home. Another option, if you say, well, you know, I'm not really a small group, uh, group person, I would prefer one-to-one -one support, we've got that too. Send a request for support through Ask IDF and one of our wonderful peer support volunteers will follow up with you via phone or email, whatever you prefer and provide support. And now at this time, I would like to introduce tonight's presenter, who I am so honored to have as 
my colleague at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, Stephanie Steele. And Stephanie is our Director of Payer Relations and Policy and has lots of wonderful information to share with us tonight. So Stephanie, I am going to stop share and you can share your slides and turning it over to you, our, our expert. Kathy, thank you very much. Are you seeing the correct slides? Just to be sure. I am trying to close some other screen here. No, we're not seeing your slides. All right. Yeah, we're seeing, um, if you close down, I think we're seeing your team screen. That's what we're seeing. Ah, apologies. Yeah, just click on the one that shows the PowerPoint. And now we're seeing your home screen. So stop. Yep. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop share for a second. Okay. And then you pull up your slide presentation. It'll be screen. Are we better? Yes, look at you. Okay. <laughs> I know sometimes it, it gets kind of confusing, but thank you. My apologies. All right. Thank you all for joining. I'm Stephanie Steele. I am our Director of Payer Relations and Policy here at IDF. Um, I recently um, took this role. I was previously our um, in the box, in the Ask IDF box, as some of you know. So um, I'm hoping that after this forum, you'll be informed about how we pay for IG therapy. Kathy's gone over our mission statement. Thank you, Kathy. So as you know, there are more than 450 of these chronic rare dis diseases that are part of the immune system that are missing functions or um, improperly working. So these diseases are caused by hereditary or genetic disorders. We, they're not contagious. Some disorders are present at birth and early childhood, but anyone can be affected regardless, regardless of age or gender. All right. So we're going to start with commercial insurance. These plans can be obtained several different ways. This can be done through your employer, a broker, or through the marketplace. So let's start about talking about HMOs. Um, these are providers and facilities that are sell a fixed package. You're going to do everything through that facility. And through this, your primary care physician is essentially your gatekeeper. You cannot go see a specialist without a referral from that primary care doctor. We also have PPOs. So these include the managed care aspect of the HMO. However, you have the flexibility to see a specialist without that referral. Next, we have indemnity, indemnity plans, your point of service and fee for service plans. With those plans, you can see any physician you want. You don't need a referral and you have the most flexibility with those plans. Now, you're gonna to have to pay your deductible every year. Then you're gonna to need to reach your out of pocket. Once you've met your out of pocket, the insurance company is going to pay for everything else. You can stay on commercial insurance until you're 26 years of age. Your children can. Um, you can also get insurance at healthcare.gov. Open enrollment at healthcare.gov is November 1st through January 15th, or if you have a qualifying life event, such as divorce or loss of a job. 
and that is at healthcare.gov. When choosing a plan, it's important to look at your needs. You wanna see if your provider's in network with that plan. And look at the out-of-pocket cost. See what's gonna be best for you and your family. Let's jump into Medicare. So we're in open enrollment right now. I'm sure you've heard. Open enrollment runs from October 15th through December 7th. So during this time, people eligible for Medicare can compare the 2023 coverage options at medicare.gov. There is also a Medicare plan finder that allows you to compare the different plans um, and show you the different options for the healthcare coverage. So that changes from year to year. And then how your medication, how IG products, IVIG or sub-Q, how that's billed is going to be strictly based upon your diagnosis code. That's going to be what your lab results are, what your clinical notes show. And that's strictly determined by your physician. It's not going to be what you want it to be. Um, you can't say, I don't want to be billed through part D. We have to go through part B or vice versa your labs are gonna say what your diagnosis is. So if something is billed through Medicare Part B, it's gonna be a qualifying diagnosis. If it goes through Part D, it's what we call a non-qualifying diagnosis. Medicare Part B. With Medicare Part B, you're required to pay your deductible. Medicare Part B will cover 80% of the cost of your IG medication. You're gonna need a secondary or a supplement to cover the other 20%. You do not need a prior authorization with Medicare Part B. If you are on sub-Q therapy, the cost of the supplies are gonna be covered. If you're on IVIG, you're gonna to need to sign up for the IVIG demonstration project. Now, this demonstration project is something that you have to sign up for annually. IDF is currently working with legislation to try to make this a permanent benefit. We're hoping to have this done very soon. So we'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. But the demonstration project covers the cost of nursing and supplies. As I said, Part B covers our qualifying diagnosis codes. So only qualifying diagnosis codes can be billed through Medicare Part B. I have them listed here. XLA is one of them. CVID with Scott Aldrich. I'll just let you take a look at this list. This is not the complete list. We've got some on the next slide. Okay, here's our next one. We see SCID, selective deficiency of Ig subclasses, and our antibody deficiency. The one that you don't see on here is hypogammaglobulinemia. That's a non-qualifying diagnosis and will always go through part D. So I spoke about the demonstration project earlier. Again, this is only for part B. It covers the cost of nursing and supplies and you must sign up annually. You need to be signed up by the 15th of the month to be eligible for the next month. I'll give you an example. It's the 20th. So say you send in your paperwork tomorrow. You're not gonna be eligible to start on that pro project until December 1st. There's the lapse. 
Now on the form, it's extremely important that every box is filled out. If it's not, they're gonna reject your form and you have to start the process all over. So if it's the 14th of the month and you got it in just in time, if you missed one little part, they're gonna reject it and it's gonna push you back. So make sure that you get every form, every box on that form filled out. It's very important. The patient and the physician need to sign it. And you can um, have your doctor just fax it right in for you. That's typically the easiest way to get it in. Now you can get this application on the Noridian website. There's also an application guide that's very useful. Um, and I have the, the links up here so you can see where exactly to find this um, project application form. And the Spanish versions as well. All right, we're gonna jump into part D. So you're responsible for the annual deductible, $233. You're responsible for the donut hole. So you have to pay $7,050. And once that is met, you're in what is called the catastrophic phase. With the catastrophic phase, you then need to pay every time that you have a prescription filled, you're gonna pay 5% of the total cost of the medication. So for your IG medication, say you're filling through your specialty pharmacy, you've met your donut hole, for your next shipment, you pay 5% the total cost of the drug. Also in the catastrophic phase, say you go to the, you know, you go to your local pharmacy, you're going to pay 5% the total cost of that drug as well. A prior authorization is always required with Medicare Part D as in drug. Always. Now, there is good news on the horizon about this donut hole and the high cost. Something was recently passed called the Inflation Reduction Act. And we're gonna go into more detail about that later, but it's great news. COBRA. So COBRA is a federal law that may let you keep your employer's group plan for a specific amount of time. It's essentially con continuation coverage um, and it is sig a significant amount more expensive than what you would have been paying. So in general, COBRA only applies to employers with more than 20 employees. However, some states require insurers covering employers with fewer than 20 um, and let you keep that for a limited amount of time. It's generally offered for 18 months. And your employer must tell the plan administrator if you qualify for COBRA um, because the employee died, lost a job, um, or became entitled to Medicare. Okay, I was talking about the Inflation Reduction Act. Here's the great news. In 2024, that 5% coinsurance for the catastrophic coverage for Part D is eliminated. It's absolutely wonderful news. Um, also, the 2000, there's going to be a $2,000 cap on Part D out-of-pocket spending starting in 2025. So that $7,000 donut hole is going to be gone. It's only going to be $2,000. The other nice thing is about that, is the $2,000 doesn't have to be paid up front. You can spread that out over the entire year. So you can pay $200, you can, you can spread it out. That's a great news. This also expands eligibility for Medicare Part D, LIS or low income subsidy benefits. 
we'll talk about LIS more in a bit. Um, this also limits monthly copay for um, insulin products to $35 um, of copay per month. I know that doesn't apply to IG therapy, but it's great news. So I thought I would share it. And it does also eliminate cost sharing, cost sharing for adult vaccines. So this is just fantastic news. Okay, LIS. Um, low income subsidy, it's a Medicare program to help individuals that have limited income and provides resources for prescription drug coverage. I have seen copays as low as $4. So if you think there's a chance that you may qualify, go to medicare.gov. It is, there's a place that says LIS. You can click on it. You can find out if you're eligible with the extra help calculator. You could also contact social security. Um, and you can also get in touch with the licensed insurance agent if that would be easier for you. But it's definitely worth looking into. Manufacturer copay assistance. If you have commercial insurance and you are on an IG product, you are eligible. As long as you don't have a governmental insurance plan such as TRICARE, then it will not, TRICARE, Medicare, Medicaid, then you cannot use this. But there is a co there are copay cards for the products. Um, you have to sign yourself up. Um, and then it's also good to know that this is typically does not cover the cost of nursing and supplies. So keep that in mind when you're either initially getting started on therapy or it's the beginning of the year. But that is good for copays, deductibles, and out of pocket costs. Okay, denials and appeals. Denials happen more often than you would even believe. Um, the insurance companies only send the reason for the denial to physicians and patients. So if your specialty pharmacy calls and tells you that you got a denial, they're gonna need that information. They're gonna need to know why. So keep in touch, keep in close contact with your specialty pharmacy. They're gonna need to know, you know, is it a formulary issue? Is it something silly where the insurance company is saying it's experimental, which we know is silly. So make sure you keep in close contact if you do have a denial so that the specialty pharmacy can work on that. Um, and the best way to handle an appeal is to have the doctor do a peer-to-peer -peer review. The, doc the doctor actually gets an answer immediately. So that's better than having a, um, a letter of medical necessity sent in. Um, but at the same time, doctors are busy. So if they can't do it, it's just going to take a bit longer. Um, after two denials, you have to go to an external appeal. Your specialty pharmacy. A lot of people don't know this, but these offer financial assistance. Now, that being said, they cannot offer it to you up front. You have to ask for it. They will not just offer it up front. Um, it's typically based upon income, but you have to ask them. Don't be afraid to ask. And a lot of people think that there's no way in the world they'll qualify. However, if you think about the cost of the medication, it's expensive and they know that. And the whole point of that program is so that you can live your life and still have your medicine. So don't be afraid to ask. Okay. There are a lot of nonprofit organizations that can potentially offer you funding. There are a lot of them. I'm going to list off just a few. The Assistance Fund, or TAF. 
Patient Services Incorporated, the Patient Advocate Foundation, the National Patient Advocate Fund, Patient Access Network, Hope Charities, Nord, Good Days, and the Healthwell Foundation. I'm gonna leave this up here for you so you can write these down if you want to. Sometimes you can apply online, you can call them. These are some wonderful organizations that potentially have some funding to help. I'll just give you guys a few minutes to write that down. Okay, that being said, there is also a program called SHIP. This is a national program that offers one-on-one -on -one assistance, um, counseling and education to Medicare beneficiaries, caregivers, and their families. Um, it helps, them make helps you make informed decisions about healthcare benefits. Um, now, when calling, it is extremely important that you know your diagnosis. It's very important that you know your diagnosis. Um, now, the link for that, it's just gonna be ACL, Apple, C as in cat, L as in Larry, dot gov. Again, it's called SHIP, S-H-I-P, if you need some assistance in that area. Some other things that I just want to reiterate because I always do, and it's very important, please, Make sure you keep or get, obtain copies of your original lab work from when you were initially diagnosed. It's so important, so important. And I'm gonna give you an example as to why. I spoke with an individual several months ago and they did not have the blood work from when they were originally diagnosed and they were getting ready to join Medicare. They didn't have pneumococcal titers. They had to stop therapy for six months so they could get those done. So please, please, if you don't have your original copies, try to obtain them. Um, if you do, keep them in a very safe place along with any clinical notes that you can have, that you have or can get your hands on. It's so extremely important. Something else that I want to bring up that IDF is working very diligently on, um, many of you may not know this, if an individual goes into a skilled nursing facility or long-term care facility, you will not be able to get your IG therapy. Um, this is a huge, huge problem. We're working with legislation on it. However, if you could help us, we would appreciate it. If you could reach out to your state congressmen or I'm sorry, senators, and um, we would really, really appreciate your help. The more people that help us with this, the the better. We just need we just need the more help we the more help we can get. It's it's terrible. It's horrible. This is happening, and we are doing everything that we can, but we are a team and the more, the more voices that we have, the better off we're going to be. And now at this time, your questions will be answered. Um, Stephanie will answer as many questions as possible within um, the next several minutes. And I would like to now introduce my other colleague who I'm honored to work with, Colleen Brock, who is a registered nurse and manager of medical programs 
at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, who will moderate the Q&A session. So Colleen and Stephanie, um, the stage is yours. I'm going to um, stop my, hide my slides so we can all see you. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. And we will try to get through questions. But as I always say, if we do not get to your question, especially if it's very case specific, please do not hesitate to reach out to Ask IDF on the website and ask your question there. You can get an answer through Ask IDF that way. So um, Stephanie, with that, I want to go back really quick and discuss the whole skilled nursing. There are a lot of people asking, what is that? Who does it affect? What does it mean? Um, just a whole variety of, of confusion and questions regarding. And the other one is, who is affected by that? Anybody with insurance or just those with Medicare or Medicaid? It affects the individuals with Medicare. It does not matter what your diagnosis is. Um, any skilled nursing facility, nursing home. Um, so if you have Medicare, it affects you. So it will eventually affect our entire community. Well, and it can also be something as simple as somebody is in a car accident and they're in a rehab facility because of that car accident. And whether you get sub-Q or IV, it does not matter, correct? That is correct. And something else that, that is correct. It doesn't matter what drug it is. It doesn't matter the route of administration. And it's absolutely ridiculous. And we are fighting so hard. And, it, and that, that's two of the questions that I got. Do you know if there's a petition that they can support? And others have asked, is there an upcoming bill that we can write to specifically to our senators and Congress people about the situation? We are working to get this on a bill. Okay. Yes. But we need, again, th the more voices that we have, the better off we're going to be. So people can just call their senators, whomever, and just tell them this is the situation. There's going to be a bill proposed. Please support it. Absolutely. And again, tell them IDF is working on it. And bring up IDF. And and you know, I want people to understand because I've known about this too. This isn't a situation where your doctor has any control other than maybe sneaking in your medication so you can give it to yourself in the bathroom hiding from people. Um, this is a very serious situation. And a lot of people don't understand that it's not just the elderly, it is anybody on Medicare and it is a government control issue. It's not anything else. It's not industry. It's not the only way that you're going to get your treatments are if you have private insurance and commercial insurance. Absolutely. And you will not find a specialty pharmacy out there that is going to ship that medication. Right. It will happen. They're not going to get paid. And it's, it's so ridiculous. And it, it's wrong. Yes. Yes. And we have to, we have to get make a change on it. We have to get this changed. Now, will you be announcing the bill or sending out if people are signed up for, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. You're okay. We'll definitely keep everyone in the loop as when we get, when we get something, when we okay. get the bill. There's, and then they can just okay. send, send it like they do if they're signed up. Absolutely. Great. Yeah. And it, yeah. If, I mean, say you, you know, say you have like a major surgery and you have to go in there to heal. Mm -hmm. You need that medication at that time more than ever. It, right. It, exactly. It's, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this, it's a huge problem, huge problem. 
Yeah. All right. So let's move on. Um, again, if you have any questions, stay tuned or, you know, concerns. It is a big concern. We are all working on it and things will be coming out as we know who to hound and how to hound and all of that, because together our voices are very loud and they are heard in DC and it will affect a lot of people in a positive way. So we appreciate all of your support, but we want you to know that we are well aware of it and we are working on it. And we are mad. Yeah. <laughs> we are mad. Yeah. As is the Nurse Advisory Committee for IDF and the Medical Advisory Committee. This is not something that we are just sitting around going, well, I wonder if the government's going to do this today. No, we, we want it solved now. So let's move on to just some general questions. Do health plans under Obamacare typically cover IG replacement? Yes. And is there a better option when you're looking at them? Not, not necessarily. I think it's good to just review the plan. Um, I actually got on, got on the site today and type, there's a place where you can type in your medication. It, so really just go with the plan that is cost effective for you. Um, you know, has everything else you're looking for and your medication. Okay. Yeah. Does payment differ if it is treat if you're treated at home versus an inpatient or outpatient? Well, even if you have a Part D as in drug diagnosis and you go to a suite, it would then be billed through Part B as in boy. So it does differ. Yes. And it's also good to know that you cannot infuse subcutaneous products in an infusion suite unless it's Hycuvia. I know that was a lot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just, I, I kind of want to go back because obviously this has rattled quite a few people and that's understandable. Uh, does Medicare supplemental insurance cover treatments in a long-term nursing facility? You're not getting that medicine at all, period. Yeah, it, you are, you're not getting it. It, and it's sickening, but you're not, you're not getting it. No. You're well, and somebody else just posted, I will even say that on commercial insurance, I have been asked if I am in a skilled nursing facility. It's a new question they are asking everyone. Really? That's just amazing. And that's the thing that people don't understand either, that commercial insurance oftentimes follows Medicare. So if you're, you know, 20, 30, 40, and you're not so much worried about, oh, I don't really care what goes on with Medicare because I'm not 65, you need to follow what Medicare is doing because oftentimes whatever they do trickles down to commercial. And if, we'll have to look into that. If that individual could put in the chat the name of their insurance company, I just want to look into that. Mm -hmm. if, please. And yeah. I have never, ever done this before in a forum. <laughs> and ever. <laughs> I cannot help myself tonight, but exactly, Colleen, what you just said, private pay very often follows Medicare's example. And I will tell you right now that in 1999, when I was sitting in my very first IDF meeting as a parent of a child who was seven years old diagnosed with PI and we had an insurance presenter there and they talked about that. They we were up talking about Medicare and Medicare issues. And honestly, I as a parent sat in that audience and I thought, oh, thank goodness my kid is insured by private pay. And the next words out of that presenter's mouth were, and if you're sitting here in this audience right now and you're thinking, thank goodness, 
I'm insured by a private pay insurance plan, think again, because they love to follow Medicare's example. And since that day, anything that IDF is working on for Medicare, yes, it impacts people with Medicare insurance, but it impacts every single one of us, even down to our children who may be seven years old. Okay, I'm sorry I interrupted, but no. I just had to share that because that was such an impactful moment for me sitting there thinking, oh, I'm good, but no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's very interesting that the commercial insurance is starting to ask that question. Speaking of following traditional Medicare guidelines, Medicare Advantage plans do not have to follow traditional Medicare guidelines. So that being said, if you have a Part B diagnosis and would be sitting pretty, being covered at 80% and then 20% with your supplement, say you have an Advantage plan, you have a diagnosis of CVID, um, they can bill it any way they want. They can choose to bill through Part D because they don't have to follow traditional Medicare guidelines. So Advantage plans are tricky and um, I'm going to leave it at that. Somebody put, you cannot get a supplement plan with Advantage plan. No, what, no, no, you cannot. What I'm saying is if you choose to get an Advantage plan, mm -hmm. they can bill it any way they want to. So say, say you didn't realize that medic, um, the, uh, Oh my word. The advantage plans can build things any way they want to. But had you just stayed with traditional Medicare, you would have been covered at hundred percent. But mm -hmm. if you didn't realize that the advantage plans can build things any way they want, you could end up with having to utilize the part D benefits and really end up in a bad spot, owing more money and then having to, you know, find an organization to help pay that out of pocket because that out of pocket's ridiculous. So do you recommend that people who are getting IG replacement steer clear of Advantage plans? Mm -hmm. And just go with traditional? Okay. All right. So going back up to just sort of some general questions. Um, here's one that, that I've run into with... How do you learn about coverage if the company withholds that information and tells you, well, I can't tell you until you become, until you have the policy, if it's going to be covered or how much it'll, it, it will cost you? Can you push them on it with traditional, with commercial insurance? Sometimes you don't know the formulary until... Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but they have to tell you you're deductible and out of pocket before you sign up for the plan. Okay. And can they tell you if that's going to go towards deductible and, and that kind of. Now, one, you might not, you won't know if your medication will be billed through medical or pharmacy, if it's going to be a medical or pharmacy benefit. Mm. You won't know that. And they don't have to tell you. Okay. What if your insurance has a clause that you cannot use a copay assistance program? The good old <laughs> copay accumulator. Okay. So there are 14 states that have made copay accumulators illegal. Now, that being said, of course, the insurance companies have found a a way to get by that as well. So it's ridiculous. Um, what you can do is talk to your HR person. Um, 
they actually are the ones choosing this plan and they can, they know if it, they can find out if the plan um, is going to have an accumulator. So you can ask them, complain to them, say next year, don't pick this plan. Don't get a plan with an accumulator. So they can actually make that choice. Now, whether they're going to listen to you or not, you know, who knows, but my advice would be to go to one of those nonprofit organizations that I had um, mentioned earlier and get that assistance because uh -huh. those, their copay accumulators are ridiculous and it's horrible. It's actually something that our state policy team is working on. How long can someone rely on copay assistance? Is there a time limit or is it as long as you are on the product? It's as long as you're on the product and um, until you get to Medicare. So knowing what the knowing what you know about Medicare and you had to sign up today, what programs would you choose to cover your IG therapy? for the least amount of money out of pocket? It would depend upon my diagnosis. So With let's say you have CBID. Um, well, I know that um, tradition, Medicare Part B traditional is gonna pick up that 80%. I would sign up for the demo, the IVIG demonstration product the day that I, the very first day that I could. So that's the day that my Medicare becomes effective because it's going to get some, take some time to get that approved. And then I would just look at the different um, supplements and see, you know, which one looked the most cost effective for me because that's going to pick up the 20%. Now, some people are saying that I or uh, nursing is not covered with the Medicare. In the demo, I think it was in the demo program. It is. Is it? Yeah, the demonstration project covers nursing and supplies. Okay. And it covers for both IV or sub-Q. So with subcutaneous therapy, um, you cannot have nursing. Nursing is not covered unless you're infusing hycuvia that very specific product, or you have a dexterity issue. Those are the only ways that subcutaneous by Medicare. Can you explain the dexterity issue and how that's covered? Yes, yeah, so that would be if an individual had trouble using their hands, couldn't you know, withdraw the medication from the vial, couldn't you know, snap the, tops off the vials or the huge vials, you know, pull that tab off, um, had trouble inserting needles. And that would be billed using a Medicare G code. Okay. Do most doctors know about that? Okay. So, no. so if somebody is having dexterity problems, they can reach out through ask IDF and we can Absolutely. give them that code to have yes. them. Okay. Yeah. We can provide that information. We also have a consulting immunology. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. they can reach out. We can provide the assistance for them, all the information. I've actually reached out to a specialty pharmacy with an individual um, to provide that information as well. Is there a supplemental plan for Medicare that you think is better in this situations? Okay. What resources are available for people who are on Medicaid or Medi-Cal? Other than financial assistance, is there anything, there's something specific to Medicaid patients? Okay. Um, hmm. I'll be honest, I don't know if, I'm going to be honest, I'm not certain if they can reach out to those nonprofit organizations. I, I truly, I'm not, I'm not certain. I would try. Yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely try. 
And to be perfectly honest, if you are uninsured, I know that one of the, you'd have to go through and look, but I know that one of those actually provides assistance if you are uninsured. One of the, one of those organizations on the list. What do you do when your specialty pharmacy says they can no longer afford to pay the price of your IG infusion medication? And then you get a letter informing you that the insurance companies determine your treatment's not medically necessary. And I know there are pharmacies now that are starting to say we can't afford to cover this medication and they're Maybe. making people change. Change product or change, change product. But then this one then took the next step and said, sorry, you don't qualify for it anyway. And basically kicked them off of everything. Yeah, I'd change specialty pharmacies and then I'd reach out to the doctor because if at one point they were, they needed the medication, why would the specialty pharmacy just say, you don't qualify? That's junk. And that's another question that somebody said, is there a way to control what specialty pharmacy the insurance company uses? What if they're absolutely horrible and I want to use another one? So... Yeah, that's a problem. Um, specifically, if your insurance company owns that specialty pharmacy, you're stuck. Okay. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's a tough situation. If if they own that specialty pharmacy, they're not going to let you go anywhere else. They want to keep that money in house. So the best thing to do is to ask if you have any options. Correct. And Sometimes. then if you don't, there's nothing you can do. Is Sometimes. it common for insurance companies to own a specialty pharmacy or not have options? We're starting to see it more. Hmm. My insurance won't approve my IVIG. I've appealed it several times and I've tried several more times. What should I do next? Mm. That's that's very specific. I would want to see the diagnosis, the lab, like, you know, the labs. Um, if that person could wouldn't mind reaching out directly, um, so we could dive into that a little deeper. Yes, and I think there's a lot of these questions that are very case specific that that we would be very happy to help with. There's somebody who put one in that says, "What do I what do I do if my insurance stopped paying for my IBIG after nine years? I'm on Medicare and have United Healthcare Map. You know, like the doctor's office has to get involved. There has to be a peer to peer. There has to be records. There, there's a way of dealing with denials." The bad part is it's oftentimes still up to us to fight the fight. And we will. What is, uh, oh, what is the best way to get past insurance and specialty pharmacy gatekeepers to get information on denials as to why you're denied when they won't tell you? They just say, well, you were denied. The gatekeepers tend to keep that gate very shut. So your insurance company has to provide that information to you. Hmm. All right. Uh, there's a lot of questions on financial assistance, and I know we've touched on it. Um, I'm reading their health plans that say they don't cover my medication when I search if they cover it, but with my government state plan, I'm with that insurance company. There are health plans that say they don't cover my medication when I search if they cover it. But with my government state plan, I'm with that insurance company. I'm not sure. I I'm wondering why that would be. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. If you want to try again. 
Um, are there ways if your insurance has a really high deductible, close to $4,000 a year to mitigate your out-of-pocket costs? Repeat that. I'm so sorry. Is, is there... A, are there ways if your insurance is a really high deductible, close to $4,000 a year that you can mitigate out of pocket costs? Oh gosh. Let's find some funding. <laughs> Funding's out there. I. Mm -mm. Why is copay assistance not available for people on Medicare and Medicaid? Oh dear. Um, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm I think that would be a great question for um for cripples. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certain that it has to do, um, like, a, I, I'm on, I'm not 100% certain. I just know that you can't, I'm really sorry. Is it, is it, um, it's, it's like a federal law, correct? It's a federal federally, law. Federally, they just cannot, mm -hmm. um, at the federal level, they will not allow copay assistance to anybody insured by a government health insurance plan is what I've understood. Yeah. And I'm not the expert, but that's what I've, I've always understood in, in that situation. Thank you. I don't, I'm not afraid to say I don't know the yeah. answer. So. It's a federal law and that's why it, you can't have assistance. Um, Stephanie, and I have, I have a question um, and I don't know, I was, in and out a bit as you were presenting, but um, in regard to copay assistance for individuals with private pay insurance, if their manufacturer of their product has a copay program, they are typically eligible for that copay program. Is that, that's correct, okay. That is correct. Yes, talk, would you talk about about that because um, I know that that tends to get confusing and um, I'm thinking that most of us here are probably not parents of adults now who have private insurance and they're on their own, but, um, and they're insured by a private pay company. What do we need to tell parents of children, adults, regardless of their age, who are insured by a private pay plan, um, who are receiving IG therapy about contacting their manufacturer about copay insurance. What can we say to them? Or um, copay assistance, excuse me. Sure. I would say, don't assume that especially pharmacy is going to sign you up. Um, if you change product, be sure that the specialty pharmacy or the clinic has your information. If you change your site of care, be sure that that information is transferred to the new site of care. There, it's not gonna be an automatic thing. You don't wanna get stuck with a bill. So make sure that that information goes from either specialty pharmacy to specialty pharmacy, one site of care to another. Um, and even insure, even though your insurance plan may change from Blue Cross to Aetna, that is another thing is if there is an insurance plan change, even though it's still you know, a public insurance plan, any change at all is so important not only to contact your manufacturer's copay program about to say, hello, I have an insurance change, but also to communicate that with your provider because very often there is a, 
a disconnect even on the provider side. Um, so that would be my non-expert um, opinion here. <laughs> you can't over communicate. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And, and I find the hard thing as um, is once our children are out from under our wings, they are on their own. But, you know, just being able to um, make sure that we aren't helicopter parents, but we are um, somehow keeping track and guiding them at an early age. And that's where our wonderful teen program comes in because we are all about that with parents and teens. But making sure that as our children are growing up, that they understand the system, not to be worried about it, but just to understand if there's any change and you're 18 or older and mama or daddy aren't, um, you know, approved to talk to insurance providers, copay programs, that they're ready to go. That's what's great about our teen program. It, it just becomes a habit and they, it's a great program. I like it. Okay, now I'm going to mute myself again. I'm not going to show. <laughs> I know they, my colleagues, apologies to everybody know that um, no, I, you're bringing up great points. I it's can't terrible. help myself. So I'm just going to mute myself. <laughs> what you. is the web address for SHIP? Do you know it? ACL.gov. Okay. And then I think some of it, I, I just want to kind of touch back again to make sure there is no confusion. One, there is nothing on the IDF website yet about this skilled facility issue because we don't have a bill yet being supported. So it is just something for you to know so that you're not blindsided should something happen, but also to get ready to help us fight the fight. Also understand that there's some confusion as to what a skilled facility. By skilled facility, we're talking about, say you're in an assisted living and you now need to move into the skilled nursing home part, that's where it's not gonna be covered. You're in a car accident, something happens and you have to be in a rehab facility. Say you have a knee replacement and you have an infection or something and you just, you live alone. So you need to go to a rehab facility for a little while to recover. You're not going to get your medicine. And I'm telling you, we've heard stories of people sneaking in meds and doing it under their covers or doing it in the bathroom. I mean, and as Stephanie said, this is when you need it the most, but it's not in the hospital. If you are in the hospital for any reason, you will get your infusions. Absolutely. So it is only when you move into those other facilities where the problem starts to occur. So I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that one. Um, the other thing with commercial plans, I've seen a couple things about this plan, but I'm on the same. So let's say you're on Blue Cross now and you're changing to a different company and they have Blue Cross too. Every single company writes their own policy for that company. Even though it's the same insurance company, they can have their own little things written into that contract. And you can fall into a black hole. I fell into it at one point. I had the coverage to get my IG replacement. I had the pharmacy to get it. I had everything. My problem was my doctor wanted it in his um, doctor's office. And very long story and several months of fighting with people later, my company that I worked for at the time had to rewrite a little disclaimer for me so that the specialty pharmacy would ship it to his office 
without their nurse having to administer it. And it would still be paid for. So sometimes you have to work with your employer and sometimes it just, it takes a lot of fighting and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but I'm just, I, I didn't give up. And so it's, you know, sometimes you have to fight that fight and it's exhausting and it's difficult and you're already fighting a fight every day just to get through the day. And I totally get it, but this is something, and, and Kathy's right. This is something kids need to start to understand early on. And when they're ready, try care. They do not cover children until they're 26. They only cover the until they're 18. If they're in the military, your children are only covered until 18. And I just learned that a couple of years ago. I thought every child was covered till they were 26. Apparently not. So there's oftentimes little things that you need to kind of read the fine print and ask questions. Attend meetings like this, you're always going to learn something. But unfortunately, like Stephanie said, and Kathy and I, a lot of it is individual. You know, I wish I could go through all these questions and go, oh, here's the answer to this. Here's the answer to this. Here's the answer to this. But a lot of it, it seems like a simple question, but we need a lot more information in order to be able to answer that question. But you have asked a tremendous amount of questions. Stephanie, you have been fantastic in answering them because I don't understand it. Half of it, I just know what I've been through in 27 years. I will tell you again, people I've I've said it before. And Stephanie was dead on with please make sure you have your diagnosis name and the lab work to support it. And that's like, if there's a fire, that's what you grab and then your children, because you don't know when the insurance company is going to go, you're denied. Our son was 24, 24 years of getting treatments. And one day I got a phone call, he's denied. And I'm like, what, did he wake up healthy? Like, this is stupid. And we had to prove, but I had the blood work from 24 years before and the letter stating his diagnosis. So it is extremely important that you have those somewhere safe, especially when you're going on Medicare, especially having that pneumovax tighter, like she mentioned. I guess that's my spiel. I don't know, insurance drives me nuts. I wish I could help everybody. I, I, I just, you know, I, I tell people, PI knows, no boundaries. You can live in a tent. You can live in a 40 bedroom mansion. It doesn't care, but we all care about how we have to pay for it and meeting deductibles, getting copay assistance. If you don't, if you get I, any kind of IG replacement, the very first step that you should be doing is contacting who makes your product and asking them if they have an assistance program. And how do you sign up? And that will save you a ton of money. Ask your specialty pharmacist. And not only ask them, ask them if they have a policy or a, a plan that will help those that aren't insured or can't afford the copays. And like Stephanie said, watch out for the advantage plans. They sound good on TV, but we get a lot of complaints about people in serious trouble that have picked the advantage plan because it sounded good at first. And then they realize they're in big trouble. Your words of wisdom, Stephanie. As always, as I just said, every single one of us makes a difference. So thank you. Spread the word about the forums. Spread the word about our resources to your clinicians and your family and friends and other people you know with PI. We are here. We're in this together. Good night.
be well, take care.